The Godfather is one of the greatest films ever made for many reasons. Uh, the production design by Dean Tavalaris is absolutely amazing. Uh, Gordon Willis's cinematography, uh, the script, Coppola's direction, and the acting is extraordinary. Every single character, even every extra, is, is really quite extraordinary, down to the smallest detail. One interesting thing, though, is, is Coppola had a very hard time getting the studio to agree to let Al Pacino play Michael Corleone. You know, for various reasons, at that point, Hollywood was still very conventional in its tastes about leading men. Um, you know, they wanted a Robert Redford type or a Paul Newman type even though this was a Sicilian family, and, and Coppola knew Pacino's work. The only really significant thing he'd done in film was Panic in Needle Park at that point, Pacino. Um, but uh, Coppola knew in his bones that Pacino was the guy for the part. Finally, after quite a long time, the studio agreed. And Coppola's reasons were excellent for having Pacino working with Pacino and we we weren't there so we don't know exactly what happened uh, but what Pacino pulled off was an extraordinary extraordinary attention to the through line of the character in the uh, in the story and what I mean by that is he went from point A where you see him come back from the war and attend his sister's wedding and with the, the whole family and a thousand people at the wedding, it seems. Uh, young, fairly innocent, um, kind of a... Uh, a good guy who has does not want any part of the family business of being in the mafia and ends up particularly at the end of at the end of part one of the godfather but also at the end of part two almost like richard nixon this grim middle-aged man who's had many people murdered and murdered a couple himself and is absolutely adamant and extraordinarily controlling in his power over everybody in his life. This change is accomplished quite organically, scene by scene by scene. You can see if you really look for the moments where Michael changes. And yet, if you're just watching the film for the first time, you're not going to notice it as though you know the actor's doing it. It's just happening, and it's happening organically, so that you believe it totally. And yet the changes are fairly extraordinary. So, if we be begin with the first scene when we see him at his sister's wedding, he's with his girlfriend Kay, played by Diane Keaton. And she's not Sicilian, she's, she's quite uh, waspy American. And... Uh, He's talking about his family, he's talking about his culture with her, seated at a little table at the side of the wedding, and she's noticing these strange people around, like Luca Brazzi, the, the family's hitman. Um, and he's explaining what's going on and who the people are to her. And he's a bit hesitant. He doesn't really... Um, open up yet. Michael? That man over there is talking to himself. See that scary guy over there? He's a very scary guy. Well, who is he? What's his name? His name is Luca Brazzi. It's as though he's a bit conflicted about the whole thing or even embarrassed about the whole thing, and yet 
he does have a kind of pride in in his family in the in the power they have in their in their culture really and so you see a young man i wouldn't say exactly in turmoil but in a bit of confusion if he's your brother why does he have a different name Oh, uh, that when my brother Sonny was a kid, he found Tom Hagen in the street, and he had no home. And so my father took him in, and he's been with us ever since. He's a good lawyer. Not a Sicilian, but I think he's going to be consigliere. What's that? That's, um, like a counselor, an advisor, very important to the family. You like your lasagna? He talks a little, he starts to be more truthful. He starts to open up and talk about uh, the family and the business and so forth a little bit. He tells the story of the famous singer, uh, Johnny Fontaine, who's uh, obviously supposed to be Frank Sinatra. Well, when Johnny was first starting out, he was signed to this personal service contract with a big band leader. And as his career got better and better, he wanted to get out of it. Now, Johnny is my father's godson. And my father went to see this band leader. And he offered him $10,000 to let Johnny go. But the band leader said no. So the next day, my father went to see him, only this time with Luca Brazzi. And within an hour, he signed a release for a certified check of one thousand dollars. Well, how did he do that? My father made him an offer he couldn't refuse. What was that? Luca Brazzi held a gun to his head, and my father assured him that either his brains or his signature would be on the contract. That's a true story. And Michael says to Kay. This is my family, Kay. This is not me. This is not me. In other words, I love my family, but I'm not going into the family business. That's not who I am. I'm not a criminal. I'm not like that. And he seems to believe it. There's one thing that's balancing his Mr. Innocent thing, which I think it's it's pretty clear Michael believes this, that he's... He's very set on becoming, uh, on not becoming a criminal like the rest of the family. But don't forget, he's going to be dependent on the family's support because it, he may go into politics, he may go into the law, he may go into something. He's going to be a big guy in life in some way. Uh, but this is a bit vague at the moment for him. He just got back from the war. And one very important thing that's often overlooked but that I think Pacino got very well, is that he was an army captain in the war. That means quite a bit, actually, if, especially World War II. If you're an army captain, by the end of World War II, you were a real leader. You had to be. Um, I'm sure there were terrible captains, but most of them actually were, were uh, quite, quite good at what they did. Um, a good reference for that actually is Tom Hanks in um, uh, Saving Private Ryan. You know, if you watch that film, one interesting thing in it is the way Tom Hanks talks with other officers is like almost technical. It's like an expert in what he does. Uh, and, and so we can kind of assume that Pacino had that kind of expertise. It's revealed later that he was actually a war hero. We don't know why. They don't say what he did uh, in a battle or, or whatever to, to earn the title of hero. Probably it was in the film and they cut it for some reason. Um, but we, we, we find out that he was indeed a war hero. What does all this mean? That he was a captain, he was a war hero. It means that he's competent in some way, that he's brave, that he's smart, or at least 
has a sense of logistics, has a sense of how to solve problems, how to, how to uh, get in and out of situations, how to assert a bit of power. And yet at the same time in, the, in these opening scenes, we don't exactly see him as a captain. We see his uniform and we see the captain's bars on his shoulders and we think, oh, okay, he's trying to get back into civilian life and he's, it's a, he's a little bit of fish out of water, but here he is with this beautiful new girlfriend at the family uh, uh, reunion. And all right, so everything's a bit confusing for us, but also for Michael. And that's subtle. It's not a big deal, except it is a big deal because it's the beginning of saying who this character is in a transition step by step by step. Now we're fascinated with the pageantry of the film and believe me that scene of the wedding is extraordinarily is an extraordinary pageant. As I said the art direction, scenic design, the cinematography, the costumes, everything is is really amazing. So we're dazzled by all that. There's also a, an interesting interplay with Marlon Brando as, as Vito Corleone peeking out of the window of his office outside at everybody having fun at the wedding, and but he's looking for Michael. Michael's his favorite son out of his three sons. And he hasn't, you know, uh, he was waiting for Michael to show up. So there's already a kind of expectation from the power of the family about Michael. How much uh, Michael feels this, it's going to be, again, quite subtle, subliminal. We don't really know, and probably he doesn't really know, but he feels it. And so here he is, he's in the family, but he's not in the family in the criminal sense. So this is the beginning. I talk about this a lot because it's quite important to say, what's the first step? Who am I? Or who am I in the sense of maybe I don't know quite who I am. Maybe I'm trying to discover who I am. Everything he's doing is trying to follow what he believes or he thinks he believes in life. I'm going to find the beautiful girlfriend. She's going to be very American, not so Italian, not so Sicilian. And and I'm going to become a successful person, but not through criminal means, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and yet he loves his family and he likes to tell stories about them as he starts to open up. And that's how he starts out. How he does it? Well, one thing that Coppola and the designers give him and the other actors is a lot of sense impressions. There's an enormous amount of sight, sound, smell, taste, all the food, uh, tactile uh, uh, of, of, the, of the skin, of the, of the sense of touch, all around him, which you can see he's enjoying Kay, his girlfriend, who's noticing all this. And he loves to watch her notice it because he's seen it, he has seen it before. But she hasn't, and it is quite a world. And so that's a, a real pride in his background and his family and his culture. And you get that too. Well, this is already an extraordinary amount of detail for an opening scene of for a character in a movie. Um, and that's how it begins. Then we move on and things start to happen in the story after the wedding. Uh, and particularly when his father gets shot, 